I would like to welcome everybody. This is the first edition of Pointless Pipelines. We're having um, a very nice discussion here with these two guests, Ole and Martin. And uh, the idea here is uh, looking to the ROI of data teams, both in terms of how they can maximize their impact and also minimize unnecessary costs and workflows. Today, so as I already said, we have two uh, guests here with slightly different perspectives on the topics. Ole Bosdorf is the VP of data in Project A, and Martin is the co-founder and CTO of Alvin. I think you guys should introduce ourselves, yourselves briefly, please, Martin. Yeah, hey everyone, thanks for coming. Um, Martin Salen, uh, CTO and co-founder of, of Alvin. Uh, I don't know if uh, everyone here knows Alvin and what we're doing, but we're a company that uh, uh, is focused on, on data lineage and, and more importantly, uh, the use cases and problems that can be solved on top of data lineage, such as uh, data discovery, uh, impact analysis, and essentially enabling data teams to get a better insight into, uh, into how their data is being consumed. What about you, Ole? Yeah, thanks for having me. My name is Ole. Good evening, everyone, or good morning, where, wherever you're joining from. So as Gabs mentioned, I run data and analytics at Project A Ventures. It's a VC firm that uh, might sound confusing initially, but we're proud of ourselves as being the operational VC, which means that once we have invested in companies, we also map out where we could potentially help to fill skill gaps or achieve milestones. And then we operationally support in various domains. And I run the domain of data and analytics. So a super productive, ambitious, and very nice to be with team of 15 data professionals that support our ventures in all kinds of endeavors, be that data infrastructure, analysis, machine learning, operationalization, these kind of things. I've been doing that for a bit of time here at Project A and very happy to talk about the conundrum of, of data RI today with Martin and you. Nice, nice. Thank you for joining us, guys. So for everybody that is here with us today, I'm not sure why, but our chat is disabled. So if you want to ask a question or make a comment, there is a QA and a uh, tab there. You can just send your questions there and I'm going to make my questions here for our guests and, and eventually start reading yours as well, okay? So I would like to start with Ole. Uh, what are your general observations on this topic um, of uh, uh, ROI from data teams from the perspective of, of someone uh, who advocates for data teams? Yeah, so this, this one's, yeah, definitely to me a bit of a paradox. I mean, I do understand the necessity of arguing for a certain ROI on an investment, such as in your data team or infrastructure. So you can get new tooling, get more headcount and so forth. On the other side, at least historically, the, the most data-driven team in the organization, the data team has really been struggling to prove any ROI on, on investments in them. So, while I understand the necessity, I feel like it's also really tough to pull off. A lot of smart people have tried before and, and failed to a certain extent, which always is a signal maybe that it's not worth to, to pursue further as an endeavor. But I'm happy to talk today a bit about like strategies that, that we've seen um, and, and sort of approaches to get a bit closer to an actual number. I don't know, but at least like a fuzzy warm feeling that the data team has a positive ROI. Hmm. And how do you like uh, decide if a venture would benefit from having a data team? So this is like historically been very much like belief driven, right? Like who doesn't believe in a single source of truth or in very well aligned definitions on what revenue or new customers. I mean, it should be like almost like absolutely clear to, to all founders and potential founders, the value that data can bring to their business. But now like looking a bit more at the current times with like a potential economic recession looming at some point, people tend to care a bit more about efficient 
growth or also cost reductions. And then suddenly, yeah, we as heads of data feel that, that we need to prove a bit more our value and cannot just count on people believing in, in data having a positive impact at all times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, do you think that tooling can somehow help uh, uh, data teams to maximize cost and, and decrease this unnecessary ones? I mean, naturally, th this is definitely a way to go. What I see data teams in our portfolio failing is when they start with the data they have or the tooling they want to use. So ideally, they should work a lot more problem focused, which historically hasn't necessarily been the case. Um, so they have been very excited about machine learning or a certain type of tooling that they wanted to use. And now, hopefully, they're a bit more forced to work problem focused. So tooling definitely is in a very important means to an end, but it should start with the end and with, with what you would actually like to achieve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and what are, are you guys trying to do to solve this kind of problem, particularly in, in Alvin Martin? Uh, it's uh, it's a good uh, good question. I mean, uh, I mean maybe maybe I can you know uh, take a little step forward and you know yeah. without going too deep into everything that we do, maybe to share some of kind of my my perspectives on on what what Ola said and you know how do you measure ROI as data teams and something that kind of we see when we talk to quite a few you know both data engineers and more you know data leads and and those is that I think like Ola said. Uh, ROI is is a quite an elusive term to define and, and even measure. And I think in you know the good in in the good days, it's a little bit more maybe qualitative uh, than than quantitative. It's like this this good feeling that we are doing something, we are building something, we are having an impact. Where where you know I think it's probably has been maybe a bit more tool focused, like modern data stack doing really cool things. And, and you know there, there is this new kind of movement, or not new. It has been been going on for 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 a long time already. With with people like um, Chad Sanderson, kind of on, on LinkedIn, talking about this data as a product, data contracts, and and I think this is you know what all is saying. Like you need to think of yourself as someone's delivering some value or some product if it's an internal stakeholder. And and when you're doing that, there's all of this existing methodology to quantify more of the impact and, uh, and measure it. And I think that's that's kind of what will uh, what will happen happen now. I think there are some like interesting examples where, let's say, you are a, a company doing e-commerce. Uh, so you have part of the data team is also uh, feeding the recommendation engine, which is like a very 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 specific, uh, you know. Thing that can be measured because the basket size increase uh, based on these initiatives so it also goes to analytics but then you have like you're in a very good position um i guess you could also say you know things like if you do reverse etl you put data back into the you know sales uh, salesforce or pipe drive then you can have some more understanding if that's being used if sales increased after you started doing that then you have some more to measure I think if you just have dashboards, uh, it is like one step missing. So it becomes a lot of, is this causality or cor uh, correlation when you try to measure the, the impact of, uh, of how data is used. Mm. And, I'm, and, just, I'm, I'm just thinking, Martin, like should data teams actually fight that battle? Like should they get involved in trying to measure their own ROI? I'm just mm. still a bit hesitant here on like overall. Why? But, Probably, especially for a data person, well, well, we know best that like the the only analysis that you can trust is the one that you sort of conducted yourself. So any ROI calculation can like is quite tough to defend. Maybe at times, like should we even fight this battle? It's a it's a very good question. I mean, I, I think. If you look at let's say the modern data stack or this industry that, that they're part of in general i think there has definitely been a tendency that a lot has been pushed on by you know investment and 
and companies trying to be category defining and and you know things like uh, self serve analytics has been like the mantra for for some time already and i think it's definitely been something that's been you know pushed very hard into data teams and and they're like following that but uh you know it, this is like maybe you know hot take or, or maybe a bit controversial but i guess you could almost argue that the old way of doing things where data teams are constantly doing ad hoc queries to salespeople, i think probably you know for a for the rest of the company there is more of a feeling oh we have people that can answer questions that helps me to move on in the process or it's not just a dashboard that i don't know what what to do with so i mean i think that's kind of where it it, it goes back that i think there are some more like fundamental questions that you know probably you should ask and i think it's not necessarily about measuring roi but i think everyone wants to have an impact right where you are are working that you feel that your work is not just going into into a vacuum and that's just you know something that you know it's a thought to play with maybe you know it's a bit you know um incendiary in that sense that we should just ditch all the tooling and go back to just doing ad hoc requests and, and kind of slack mm. slack responses but but I think you know if you look at alignment within a company and 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 what let's say salespeople, uh, you know they have quotas. They are kind of working to get stuff done, and it's like natural for them to you know need answers quickly and maybe maybe expect to get that versus having to you know shift the culture towards that uh, there is a dashboard for for uh, for that. So I think it's a, it's a good question, uh, but I, I think m maybe it's more of a of a, um, of a matter of the times we're living in that, well, maybe teams shouldn't have to prove their ROI, but to some extent it's it's becoming more a necessity that any team or maybe at least the leader of the team or someone managing a team has to kind of fight a bit for the budgets and, and uh, um, uh, you know, resources that go into the team. Yeah, and especially this fighting for budget, I think it's just something that data teams historically maybe are not that used to or proving their value to the business, which like one of the observation within our portfolio was that in, like recent redundancies that, that were made to, to cost cutting, basically a lot of data peeps were, were actually let go, which was surprising to us and, and, and led to the question, okay, apparently these teams were either not delivering enough value or at least they were not like publicly showing how much value they were delivering. Um, and then it gets us to the discussion, okay, how can, how can teams basically get, get better at this? And I like the, the, the train of thought that you delivered there previously, which was, okay, historically, we've been just like providing data and building reports, but now we can actually insert ourselves more into the business and, and operationalize the, the data assets that the team is producing, right? So through things like reverse ETL through basically like doing more than just than just reports. Is that something that you see as a as a growing trend within within your customer base at Arvin? Um I wouldn't say so actually. Like it's uh it's quite quite few uh companies that we talk to that have like fully jumped on the on the reverse ETL and uh and that train. Certainly some companies are are doing it, but uh, but it doesn't feel like it's uh, it's a huge thing uh, just yet. But I think it's uh, it's probably also because um, like to leverage that you also need to have these tools and and capabilities to to use them. And then you probably are uh, you know at a certain stage or or a certain size where you you know need to pump data back into Salesforce. Then uh, there's quite a lot of thought and consideration that needs to go into designing kind of that data model and, and how that that flow should be uh, versus kind of relying more on on reporting and, and analytics in, in like the traditional sense and ad hoc kind of queries as uh, uh, as needed. I think that's you know if anything it's I kind of I kind of keep getting back to that. It's it's, it's you know it's it's surprising how or not surprising I guess but it's interesting how much that's still part of companies even though like you know on the outside they're very much you know part of the you know doing everything in like the modern way and everything but but still there is this like lack of trust in in, in the dashboards and and there is this like almost friction where well we want to do this you know build dashboards and go to the dashboard but then it's not trusted and that's kind of what brings me back to if you look at what roi means or 
or I mean, if you look at something like a performance review or like peer review, that is it's quite common these days. Uh, yeah. uh, let's say that if you want to peer review someone, then usually uh, the questions will be around what impact do you think this person is having, and is this person helpful, or is this person someone that's driving things forward? And and you could almost argue that that's like a lot will be a lot more evident if if uh, data teams would be like providing answers to questions quickly, which is kind of what we want to avoid with this self-serve analytics. So it's just like get some interesting perspectives that I, I think inherently there are things with um, with this work that makes it very hard to quantify uh, the ROI and, and and leaves more like yeah you have you have to you know uh, find proxies for for it which which is inherently very very hard. Yeah, and I think like it's especially hard for the data team. I feel like other stakeholders might even be better positioned or take to prove the value of the data team. Like in an ideal world, if for example, budgets for the data team get cut, ideally marketing and sales or product are the first ones to scream and riot because they know they won't be getting the insights, the assets that they need to optimize conversion rate or allocate marketing budget better or understand where there are bottlenecks in the sales pipeline. So in an ideal world, and this is also what this guy um, called Mikkel Dengel, so I think from, from Monzo is basically proclaiming, like in an ideal world, you don't even have to prove your data team's ROI, let the stakeholders do that for you. But that in turn really requires like inserting yourselves into their day-to-day -to, -day to understand their needs and, and how, to bring, how to bring value to them which I like as sort of a train of thought. Yeah. So I just would like to say that we were able to enable our chat. So if everyone wants to chat with us, you can do it right now here in the chat tab. So guys, we got some questions coming here. Um, we got this one from Bjarki Gram. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name properly. Sorry for that. Uh, what does data team entail her? To me, there is a big difference between domain-specific data analytics data scientists versus data platform engineers that function more as enabling teams. Yeah, I, I can I can take this one, Martin, and then maybe you you trip in. Um, but I very much agree. So our team is also split into, even though they're all generalists, they're either generalists within well, data engineering and infrastructure, or more within analytics. And that's for a good reason. So I think for on the analytics side of things, you can tie these a lot more closely to an actual KPI that is important for the business. You can assign a data scientist on a specific fraud prevention initiative. And by improving accuracy here, you might actually be able to come up with an ROI, not for the data team, but for this initiative. Now on the other side of things, when we look at the data platform and infrastructure, this will be, like almost impossible to derive any meaningful ROI from this, simply because someone who is speeding up DBT or ensuring a better data integration, that's gonna be really tough because it affects very things, hopefully positively downstream, but hard to measure what the ROI on this is. So I guess the closer the data professional is to the business, the more likely, at least on certain initiatives, you could get a bit closer to arguing for some sort of an ROI. Right. Want to say something about this, Martin? No, I think it. I mean, it makes sense. I think maybe the question was kind of directed when I when I was talking about the, um, uh, you know, if if a data team is doing work that's directly related to the product metrics, such as, you know, a recommender system or something, then, then it's easier. And I think it's a fair point that, uh, that um, in, in some companies there is a difference. So you have like the pure, let's say more analytical and more like platform uh, type engineers that is more about the pipes of the data and getting it there. And then you have the more like, you know, the ones that actually do the data modeling and the data science part. So yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's definitely a, a good point, but, I guess like what what all is saying, and you know what I'm also like, you know, in an ideal world, uh, maybe you know they can converge so that it's it's kind of clear that the, you know that's kind of where we want to go, right? Or that's like the good type of ROI where we actually can have some some real quantified uh, metrics on you know what's the impact of the data team, where 
where you know as we're discussing now at the moment is is quite hard and i think that you know especially in the current market situation makes things difficult because it can it can raise the questions like you know are these layoffs you know you know something that that makes sense maybe it makes sense now how does it affect the company in the longer term and, and these types of things nice uh, we got some more questions coming. Thanks, everybody, that is sending questions for us. Send yours in the Q&A or in the chat, if you prefer. Um, we have one here that I think it should be. <laughs> what is your definition of pointless pipelines? <laughs> that is a good one. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it's uh, it's kind of, it will be changing topics a little bit. Of course, it's a, it's a catchy name. Um, yeah. But uh, I think it uh, it ties a little bit into the um, uh, you know the modern data stack and, and the focus in general on on self serve when it comes to self serve as in 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 BI and analytics, but also this uh, tools like DBT uh, making it very easy for anyone to to write data pipelines. So it's not like fully self serve, but by self serve it's like it's something that previously required. Uh, quite a lot of work from really involved people into something that someone that knows basic SQL uh, can write. Um, time and time again, uh, we you know come across teams um, that are seeing this like almost spiraling effect where it's great that it's so easy to you know produce new data models and new tables, but it's it's like a lack of governance and lack of let's say quality assurance on um, on, um, on on you know is this you know duplicated is this you know what's the definitions here does this you know relate to the current business concepts that we already are uh, you know are, are working with um and i think you know on the back of that you end up with uh, like hundreds maybe thousands of of models and tables uh and no one really sh you know, knows should we delete them, should we not? Well, someone created them at, at, at one point in time. And this also goes with things like airflow, right? That things that stay in companies over time, but no one really has the full overview. And then and then when you look at it, you have a pretty big uh, you know, set of jobs and queries that are running, that are just taking compute and storage uh, over time. And um, no one really you know, knows if these are useful or not. And, most of them are, you know, probably not. Uh, maybe someone left. Uh, they're, they're still there. So that's kind of what you mean by pointless pipelines. In a nutshell. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more because that's exactly what I what, what I do see out there with DBT making data transformation so accessible. Unfortunately, there will also be fifteen derivatives of the orders table that actually all do something very similar, but people didn't have the diligence to adjust existing logic and just wrote new stuff. And while in product and tech, they, they can be like very concerned with what to act, what to add to the actual product or not. In data, we just keep adding, I feel like to production, we just take another pointless pipeline live mm -hmm. because it in, at least historically didn't cost a lot. And now we see that there's a lot more transparency needed over what pipelines are actually doing and which ones are really pointless because Snowflake builds are increasing or for any other database. And that makes suddenly like cost optimization, like a really viable topic that, that data team should be pursuing now, probably, probably more than ever. So trace down, trace down these pointless pipelines. <laughs> yeah, I think also that just to like add the final thing there that it's no, you can kind of say that the pointless pipelines in terms of uh, cost or compute, this is kind of one thing, but, but if you look at cost in, in a bigger perspective, it's also just time wasted trying to understand, you know, things and how things are related and, and what to use and what not to use. So it's like, a, you know, in general, they're, they're pointless because they create so much extra cost work and, and I guess confusion around, you know, what is the definition of uh, of a certain concept in the business, for instance. Yeah, and and how does how do you think that lineage uh, uh, can help with that, Martin? Because you've been working in that for the past, I don't know, three four years. And uh, what's your take on this? What how lineage can help on this? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good good question. So. I think you know we we don't only talk about lineage, but we talk about usage uh, yeah. as well as part of it. So, 
um, I, th I think if you if you look at all the pipelines that that you're running, uh, I think what things like DBT and Airflow doesn't really give you is a good understanding of what's like the you know let's say what's the value of these pipelines, what's the what's the consumption uh, of the things that are produced by these pipelines over time, and I think you know just something simple uh, like that uh, would allow companies to you know. You could almost like uh, overnight cut uh, a lot of these uh, pipelines that are just, you know, producing uh, new tables, producing tables, and you have this like, if you look at this from a you know a computer science perspective, like a big graph, you might have huge kind of branches that you can cut off uh, because they don't really carry any any weight as they're not really used and they're not connected to any dashboards or or any you know significant uh, downstream um, usage. So. But I think you know that that's kind of what what in, in Alvin like the thinking is that lineage is is like an enabling technology that can be used to analyze these types of things and, and yeah provide more actual insights than than just looking at a huge diagram. Makes sense, man. So we got more questions here. People are engaged here. Nice friends. Uh, let's get this one from. Um, what has been the impact of the modern data stack on cost? I think this is something that we were discussing this week, right, Martin? Uh, uh, we had a chat about uh, cost and how people are more uh, 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 giving more importance to this in the in the past years. And actually, I just ran a poll here um, to to ask people here in the chat uh, if cost is a concern for your for for your data team. Sorry, and most people said that yeah. Most of them are like pretty concerned about it. So, what is the impact of the motor that they stack on cost on your point of view? Um, it's it goes into kind of what what we already were discussing. Really, that uh, there is a huge proliferation of uh, of data uh, models and and tables all, all over the place. And I think the the issue is a little bit that with the modern data stack. You have no guardrails. Uh, you have really, really powerful tools uh, that are put in hands of people. That you know, uh, you have a data analyst that now encompasses what previously was a data engineer, a data scientist, a data architect, and potentially you know um, a database admin. They would do all all of those things, and and then you can write really inefficient queries that either are optimized by the query optimizer uh, or or just executed super super fast because the the inefficiencies are swallowed by the sheer power of something like BigQuery and, and Snowflake. And I had a very sobering experience the other day. This this affects anyone. Uh, we were doing some work in in Postgres to do some analytics, and and suddenly we had a query taking ten minutes. And and then I looked at it. I was like, this is really stupid. Like, why am I doing all of these uh, CTEs and and this you know um, very uh, inefficient things that I looked at and I was like, well, I've just gotten used to working like this because it's so fast and easy. And I think that, you know, it was a bit like, okay, this is part of the problem with all of these great tools that, that somewhat, uh, the, um, the craft is a little bit forgotten. And I think it's been kind of accepted in many ways because, uh, uh, you know, it's been good days so far, lots of funding kind of markets have been, been good. And now there is like, a shift more maybe also data teams are are you know they are seen also as a cost center and and with that becomes this more focus on what's the actual cost we're racking up here like in tools like bigquery you can easily easily rack up thousands of dollars on on just one query uh, so uh, it uh, this is real you're going to say something Ole? i mean I, I, like initially my thinking was like it was positive because there was much less vendor login and like end to end data platforms, but that is now slowly changing, right? Because the, the modern data stack is, is more and more sort of like single point so solutions that need to be well integrated with each other. So there's a direct tooling cost, but even more importantly, there's like a strong integration. Um, and with a, like, if you lack transparency over how things are connected and how data is flowing through the systems, that will lead to immense costs for, for both tooling, but also for just hours spent by your team figuring out what's going on. And so root cause analysis can be a major 
like a resource driver for some of the, the teams that, that we are also working with. Um, so it's turning yeah, to be like a bit less positive than I would initially have thought. I see. So we have another nice question here. Um, I'm being asked right now to radically reduce the costs in my data team and stack. What would you recommend to respond to the management and finance team? So I, I can try this one. So let's assume that unfortunately, this belief driven approach that we discussed initially, hey, everybody should know how much value data brings eventually to a business. Let's say this simply doesn't work. So one thing that we realized um, with like lack of executive buy-in still might make a lot of sense is focusing on important quick wins. So mapping out strategic objectives of the business and then seeing how certain data assets, certain initiatives by your team can positively affect these specific initiatives. That might be that you have a churn problem. Now suddenly having the data team perceived as solving a very important churn problem by understanding what drives churn and then driving experiments from this to hopefully reduce it. This is like an important, might not be a quick one, but it's an important win that the executive team will deeply care about. And by delivering these kinds of success stories, you might turn the tide and then hopefully it will be a bit more belief driven. We won't get to an actual figure for what the ROI of the team is. But the executive team, through these kinds of strategic initiatives that have a positive impact, they might believe more in, like, hopefully reducing a bit less headcount and, and tooling costs. Does that make sense to you, Martin? Yeah, the think, Martin. Yeah, no, I think it makes makes total sense. It's, uh, it's. Uh, I mean, I think it's again probably a little bit of a of a sign of the time that everyone needs to prove their their value and. And it's it's kind of that, that that's how it is. But but I think what you're saying is is almost like how any data team should operate. That they they are you know building they are an enabler for the rest of the business and you know should be seen as someone that provides insight or actionable insight to the company to understand how can we improve the product, how are we tracking, and that should really really kind of be the um, be the goal for for any data team. And I think. Probably this this question maybe has come a little bit from you no know, a data team that has been in this more let's build dashboards let's kind of do these things because this is what we think the company needs and then you know it's surprisingly how many companies operate like that where where they're you know just building what is the like basic metrics you think is needed and 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 no one really you know thinks too much uh, about it like is this actually being used like is this driving value and I think that's where you know maybe even setting up some I mean a specific you know in this case would be maybe setting up like uh you know get the PMs involved or I don't I just misclicked it here <laughs> okay in the, the recording but it's it's recording again sorry yeah no just saying I think you know in this specific case I think it would be actually involving PMs or, or stakeholders really and, and you know looking at what are your problems how can we help you um and uh, and starting starting from uh, from there i think that's how you you know create this sense of uh, like like all says like there this team is actually helping us drive value and yes maybe we can't quantify exactly but well we uh, have had these wins on the sales side or increase of product metrics uh, well i guess that is quantifiable actually so i mean ultimately it comes down for me to and this is something i'm personally struggling with like how much can the data team be accountable for for a company's success? So historically, as we said, we're the report builders, the data providers. But if you like, if success in terms of, love, for example, growth is never really attributed to the data team, it's going to be tough for you to argue for any kind of investments in the data team. So quite recently, in the latest, I think, DBT podcast, there was this guy on who basically owns growth and data at the same time and makes um, well this like a total data driven growth play and basically says the data team only succeeds when they are also accountable for growth. I'm not sure how far I buy into this, but it's definitely an interesting train of thought because if you succeed at it, then it will be much more easy to, to argue for data investments. 
Yeah. So I mean, there, there's there's even if, if you look at how some companies organize, there's there are some companies with the philosophy that every team should be self-contained, right? So that any team is is like a product team that that needs to do all of these things uh, themselves. And in that case, it's almost like an extreme version where you would have a data engineer or someone responsible for getting the data, processing it, and and having the metrics they need to inform the product development to you know look at all of these metrics you need to build a product and, and understand if it's successful or not and in that case you know the team would justify their existence based on their overall metrics and and it will kind of you know solve the problem altogether but then not all companies can do this and, and you know everyone's created differently but you know, I think that is an interesting train of thought. What I'm saying here is kind of the extreme version of what you're saying, Ola, that there is like this this very clear alignment with uh, the goals and the tasks of the data team on the on directly on the company metrics, not just on providing some some dashboards, but more about um, the actual metrics that they are part of um, impacting. Yeah. So we got some some comments here related to this this last question. Clara said she loved this one because she feels the pain every day, and apparently <laughs> lots of people do feel the pain too because everybody's agreeing here. Uh, Ilya is saying that he thinks that the lack of executive buy-in is a common problem. Without a strong sponsor among decision makers, it gets challenging. Uh, Bjark he commented that. Uh, we had a longer discussion about this at my previous firm, not only for data, but, the, but for the software development, software development as well. The company was very focused on uh, having a great software development platform, but how to quantify the value of the developers that developed this platform, we never reached the consensus. Yeah, reaching, uh, uh, measuring the value per uh, uh, value and productivity, it's, <laughs> I'm not sure if it's harder or, <laughs> or it's almost the same as, as data things, but it's it's hard. Um, we got I feel, some... Uh... I right. feel like we're this is uh, getting into this Elon Musk and Twitter. Uh, yeah. Right now. Uh, so it's yeah. uh, a bit like sketchy, uh, or or it can be a bit bit uh, uh, sensitive topics, uh, I guess. But I think it's interesting uh, when it comes to. I mean, I think again when you, even when you look at software engineers, I guess you know I think you know product metrics, uh, you know, generally should be should be used because. I think it's probably a bit more fair on the team because then it's more about the, sh the common effort of the team to to move the needle versus looking specifically at. Uh, so I think even if you say time to production, as someone mentioned here, I, th I still think that's a that's like a product team's responsibility because it, it really involves QA and testing and all these other things. That's not just like the, the responsibility of the software engineer, which is quite similar to a data engineer in, in that sense. Yeah, we got a, another question here. This is from Mark. He's asking if you can give some recommendations on literature on the business impact uh, data ROI issue. Yeah, in preparation yeah. For, for this one, I read up on some stuff. The two things that I liked the most was an article by the, the Mikkel Dengso. Um, it's called ROI of Data Work. And then the other one was, don't tell your data teams our eye story. And um, by, I think this is by a guy from Hex. Um, and I like both quite a lot. I uh, argue that generally they understand the necessity of, of looking into data teams our eye, but probably it doesn't make a lot of sense to pursue an actual number, but rather steer like general belief in the business that our eye is positive without needing to actually come up with Hundred percent or three hundred percent. Yeah. So, do, do you have something, Martin? No, I think I think Ola Ola covered uh, covered it. Great. So, I just ran another poll here related to measuring data impact. I asked our attendees if they are currently measuring the data team's impact in any quantified way, and more than half actually, like eighty percent. Uh, 
has answered no or we're trying it. <laughs> so I'd like to understand how you guys are trying it, how you folks are trying it. If you want to share with us something in the chat, I'll, I'll read in a few minutes. So yeah, let's get another question here. Um, we got one related to the layoffs. If you guys think that the layoffs we're seeing the data space harm these businesses in the long run. I, I guess that remains to be seen. That's like we all don't have a crystal ball necessarily. Um, it depends a bit on the maturity stage in which these teams are. So if they still struggle a lot with data quality and aligning definitions, establishing a single source of truth, letting people go at this point will definitely hurt them harder down the road than if they are at a later maturity stage at which they already are running sophisticated ML powering features from the data platform doing like these reviewers ETL use cases. I mean, you might still want to pursue those, um, but like slowing down the team here a little bit might might have a bit less of an impact, but it's, it's, it's tough to say, no, Martin? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I would, would agree. So, I mean, I think you probably have like more insight specifically in this solar, given your kind of work on supporting, supporting different teams, but but, but I, I would agree in, in general, it's, uh, if something is nascent or if something is, you know, you don't have it kind of figured out, it's probably quite a bad, bad choice to, um, to fire them. But, but it's also like, you know, do, do you, do you need, I think for some companies, this might be a question of, do you need that many people on the data team? And you know, what, what is the basic needs? Um, and kind of going back to these previous discussions, like what is the actual need and, and what should we deliver? Um, and maybe sometimes you find that, well, we can actually do this in a simpler way with fewer people than for some companies that's a call they have to make to you know actually stay profitable or, or stay in business so mm. yeah we got one specific for ole here from joao he's asking um do you mean to seek support from the executive sponsor and bring up success stories up in that cost reducing reducing question um I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, is, is this one in the chat? Yes, it's on q and uh, I'm reading it. Ole, do you mean okay. to seek support from the executive uh, sponsor? He, he put sponsor in quotes and bring up success story up in that calls for the same question. Yeah, so I, ideally you have that executive. I mean, the, the ideal case would actually be that data is part of the executive team, right? But unfortunately within at least our portfolio of 70 ventures, we see that super rarely, and uh, like a chief data, chief analytics officer position. So yeah, you need that executive sponsor and then need to be like pretty outspoken about these kinds of success stories by presenting them in a town hall within the exec meeting if possible, maybe even adding a board slide here or there, just to make sure that this is being talked about and, and, and the sticky. Um, so sometimes there are these little quick wins that suddenly justify a, a big increase in terms of data investments, just because people now believe and actually see the, the face value of, of an analysis or, or report. Nice. So we are in our last 15 minutes here. So we got lots of questions here. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to pick every single one of them, but we got one here from Mark. Um, he wanted to hear some best practices to how to calculate monetary value for the impact of the data team. Do we have any? Martin, what do you think in terms of best practices? Uh, again, it's uh, like I said, it's when they go to monetary value, uh, it's it also gets very specific. Um, yeah, I think it's uh. This it is inherently very hard because it depends also on how the company is uh, is set up really. Uh, if you look at the monetary impact, is that kind of about you know how much you spend on the data team uh, versus how much is generated in sale or or the kind of the, the cost of the data team it, itself? So it's uh, I, I would probably say that uh, I wouldn't have a very you know good answer to it and. I think that, or a good answer to that monetary side, I think if you are running a very advanced uh, operations with a data platform team and you, you know, you have the ability to, to measure the product impact um, through things like 
uh, if you have a recommend, recommender system or product features that are powered. Uh, if you don't have that, uh, you know, I think it will be very much, uh, you know, a research effort to figure out and maybe more like a qualitative um, approach. But yeah, to be honest, I'm not sure how good those numbers would be. Um, yeah. So, I mean, maybe I would give it back to Ola uh, if, if you have had any experience with that, but it's a very, very hard question. So I, I wish I, I wish I had, um, had, a, had a really good answer for it. Maybe, maybe we got like, another one here that, uh, sorry, Ole, but we, we got another one here. Uh, if not ROI, what metrics can teams use to judge success? Maybe this one can, can help in your answer now. So um, if not ROI, for example, it's in cost reduction or like very, very simple or well-scoped things like you move to a more privacy-friendly web tracking solution and thus avoid a massive GDPR fine. I mean, that has like clear business impact that you can talk about. It's not the RI of your entire team, but on this specific initiative. What are other things that you could look at? Definitely like manual hours saved. So one thing that our team is becoming increasingly good at is for example, schedule data extracts um, into people's Google Sheets that they work with anyway, so they don't have to do this themselves or annoy people within the tech team. So like manual hour safe is a pretty good one. Same goes for like, just generally, I think Ben Stansford argues for decision speed being a pretty good metric to basically evaluate the performance of a data team. How long does it take a person once there is a question that should be answered by data to actually find that data? So ROI, very tough, but like there's other proxies to to basically get there maybe. Yeah, I think just like an addition to that, of course, uh, in, in in Alvin, we're also building tools to, to help data teams improve and essentially, you know, uh reduce the time they spend on on just meaningless tasks and and be more efficient so you know that it's possible definitely to put a monetary value on you know how much cost is saved how much uh, hours are spent doing more productive things but that's kind of you know what are the improvements that can be made in the data team's day-to-day -day business but when it comes to the impact on the business itself that's also like a, a different question so they are related in the sense that the company, the data team can focus on more value adding tasks, but if there's not a structure in place, like someone mentioned OKRs or, or customer support, like if there's not a structure overall in company to track these metrics, uh, it will be quite hard to find that, um, um, not, not just like there's a feeling of value, uh, but the actual, you know, what is the um, monetary contribution. We got an answer here from Joao related to the to the how they measure uh, uh, value in their company. And he's saying that we're trying through related OKRs. For example, data team provide, provides NLP feeling analysis for marketing, and we keep an eye on the marketing OKRs about recurrent complaints, customer retention, and NPS. The first two are directly relatable to monetary value. Okay, that is nice. Yeah, so friends, I think, uh, I'm going to wrap up because we are already at the end. I'd like to thank you very much, uh, you guys, for the discussion. It was really nice. And I'd like to thank everybody that is here with us right now for the first edition of the Pointless Pipelines webinar. We're going to have other editions as well. I'm going to put the link to our newsletter so you folks can subscribe and uh, keep up with all the content we are creating. We are already... Um, planning to do uh, also a um, YouTube channel uh, for uh, content uh, related to data. We also got a medium and we are posting almost daily on LinkedIn. So keep up with us and thank you everybody. Yeah. Want to say some last words, Martin? Um, no, I think you wrapped it up nicely, but <laughs> yeah, thanks for everyone that, that came and wanted to, to listen to some of the uh, you know, musings of, of me and Ola on, on these topics. And, and thanks for the questions and contributions from Ferro. Yes. So thank you, everybody. And see you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.